Are you tired of nuclear warheads that are too powerful for everyday use? Are you sick of dropping 100 kilotons on a target when just 5 or 10 would do? Are you overpaying for oversized payloads? You need a carefree, low-yield nuke that you can actually use. One that makes your arsenal flexible enough for all of your first use or retaliatory needs. You need baby nukes. Baby nukes are small, flexible, and affordable warheads. They fit right into your existing delivery systems. Don't settle for an arsenal built for deterrence. Baby nukes are made to be actually launched. Baby nukes might even help you leverage for better terms in international arms control treaties. No nuclear arsenal is complete without baby nukes. Baby nukes may not conform to the standard of proportionality as defined by the law of armed conflict. Baby nukes utility in arms control negotiations is not guaranteed. Call your commander in chief if you experience unintended conflict escalation. Your next nuclear conflict just got easier with baby nukes. Thanks, baby nukes! Okay, so maybe you won't find them in the as seen on TV aisle, but the idea of smaller and potentially more usable nuclear weapons has been around forever. And their proponents do think they're pretty amazing. Over the course of our nuclear history, they've come in all shapes and sizes, from so-called backpack bombs to the Davy Crockett nuclear rifle. And last year, the U.S. deployed a new one. But what exactly are these things? Do we need them? And what does the deployment of a new generation of them reveal about the U.S.'s nuclear posture? Today on Things That Go Boom, we're going to talk about low-yield nuclear weapons, or what we've affectionately termed baby nukes. Experiencing the news each day can feel like a journey. With Up First from NPR, it doesn't have to be. Welcome to 15 easy minutes of breaking news, clarity on international and national affairs, all handed over not from some floating voice in the sky, from us, Layla, A, Steve, and me, Rachel. Start your day informed. Subscribe to Up First wherever you get your podcasts. Baby nukes go by lots of names. Low-yield nuclear weapons... Tactical nuclear weapons, non-strategic nuclear weapons, and just like the name, what exactly constitutes a baby nuke is a little shaky. Throughout our nuclear history, we've tried to cram small nuclear warheads onto everything from short-range missiles to artillery shells, landmines, depth charges, torpedoes, and those Davy Crockett rifles I mentioned earlier. One of these gadgets, the W-54, was literally engineered to fit in a duffel bag. The idea being that a soldier would put the bomb on the ground, set the timer, and run. Which left me wondering, how in the world did this become yeah, a things thing? Are, things are happening. All right, things are happening. Okay, perfect. To get some context, <laughs> I called up an expert from the arms control community. My name is Matt Corda. I'm a research associate at the Federation of American Scientists. We track global nuclear forces across all nine nuclear armed countries. And he took me back to the early days of the nuclear program. Gage was born. And what nuclear There's bomb no technology used to be like. So early atomic weapons like the, um, the ones dropped on Hiroshima and, and Nagasaki, they were around like 15 to 20 kilotons, which was enough to destroy the majority of a city, but the bombs themselves weighed about 10,000 pounds. Mm. These bombs did what they were intended to do. But the thinking was that their size might limit the situations where they could be used. For example, if one found oneself with a need to confront the Soviet Union's much larger army on the battlefield, but, you know, not blow absolutely everyone away. So Matt says that after Hiroshima and Nagasaki during the Cold War, there was a push to develop bombs with bigger explosive power in smaller packages. Uh, newer nuclear weapons, which today we would now know as thermonuclear weapons, can reach these insanely high yields. And we're talking about hundreds of kilotons or even thousands of kilotons, which is almost 100 times the size of those um, early atomic weapons without actually increasing the weapon's mass. Uh, in fact, actually, the bombs got smaller. These thermonuclear weapons were capable of a much bigger blast. But... Physically, they were a lot smaller than what the U.S. dropped on Japan, which opened up a whole world of possibilities, leading the U.S. to try out things like the Davy Crockett and 
actually train special forces to use those backpack bombs. But this is also where we see the introduction of what we might consider modern-day baby nukes. Because some of the thermonuclear weapons had another advantage that we still use today. What if you don't actually want that ridiculously high yield? What if you decide on what their explosive power is at the moment that you launch them? You can turn to something called dial a yield, um, which <laughs> it's also called variable yield, but dial a yield is um, a little more, <laughs> more descriptive. Um, and when you dial a yield, you have the ability to set the bomb's explosive power pretty much anywhere between under a kiloton to several hundred kilotons. The U.S. has about a thousand of these dial yield baby nukes in its arsenal right now, all of which can be delivered by air. And a good number of these weapons are stationed with our NATO allies at bases in Italy, Germany, Belgium, the Netherlands, and Turkey, which is not without concern. Those weapons in Turkey have raised some eyebrows in recent years. The Injurlik Air Base behind me has been the focus of much intrigue in the past few days. How secure are Turkey's military installations after Friday's failed coup? Reports suggest the commanding officer of the base has been detained along with 10 other soldiers. Not to mention that relations have soured between the U.S. and Turkey. And, well, it's never good to be on bad terms with a country that has your nukes. But that whole suite of baby nukes are also of questionable utility since improvements in air defense and radar technology make them tougher to deliver by air. By submarine, however, baby nukes stand a better chance at reaching their targets undeflected, which is exactly why, last year, the Trump administration deployed a brand-new submarine-launched baby nuke, the W-76-2. It's a warhead with a yield of about 8 kilotons that can't actually be dialed up and down, but it doesn't need to be, because on Ohio-class subs— it rides shotgun along some other massively powerful strategic warheads, either of which can be loaded into the exact same missiles. So think of the warheads like Pez, and the missiles like your favorite Garfield Pez dispenser. Load up the missile with your Pez flavor of choice, cherry or grape, a baby nuke, or its way bigger brother. So instead of dial yields, which are flexible across a mid- to low range of explosive power, this PEZ dispenser system covers both extremes. The proponents of the warhead describe it as this flexible option. So why do we need these things? What, what, is, the logic, <laughs> what is the logic behind their development? Why do we need small nuclear weapons? Uh, do we need small nuclear weapons? Great, 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 do we great need great small question. nuclear weapons? <laughs> I mean, yeah, fair question. So I asked Matt where the drive to make them comes from starts with this idea of something called escalate to de-escalate. In the final years of the Obama administration, there were a number of Western analysts who were convinced that Russia had formally adopted some kind of escalate to de-escalate posture with respect to nuclear weapons. You have to believe what they say when they say they have a policy of escalate to de-escalate. And, so, and in practice, they suggested that this meant that Russia um, had significantly lowered its threshold for nuclear use. Uh, they could use nuclear weapons first in a way to try to frighten Western and U.S. leaders into backing down uh, on terms favorable to Moscow. Those uh, folks so called for the development of this low-yield warhead for the United States' nuclear-armed submarines with the idea that this capability would counter this new Russian doctrine. It's worth noting that this sort of pretzel logic makes sense to war planners, even if it seems far-fetched to normal people. The thing about that, though, Matt says, is that escalate to de-escalate is not an especially useful term, or at least not a particularly fair one to put on Russia, because it's how most states react to threats on a regular basis. There are plenty of examples of countries rolling out and rattling a big fat saber nuclear or no to say, hey, we're serious. If you don't back down... We'll kick your ass. But beyond that, the evidence that Russia has adopted this policy is also fairly slim. In fact, they've denied it exists. And so, you know, there are some folks who would say that could Russia be keeping this escalate to de-escalate policy a secret? And in theory, I would say, you know, sure, but it doesn't really make that much sense. Deterrence is the art of producing in the mind of the enemy the fear to attack. You know, basically, if, if your whole deterrence posture is just fuck around and find out, <laughs> then that's going to lead to a whole bunch of confusion and maybe the potential for 
um, catastrophic miscalculation, yeah. right? So in, in my mind, it's actually in Russia's interests to communicate their posture very clearly. And at the very least in, in public documents, they've been really consistent over the past few decades. I wanted to know what a hypothetical nuclear version of escalate to de-escalate might actually look like. So I talked to Rose Gottemuller. I'm the Payne Distinguished Lecturer at the Freeman Spoley Institute, part of the Center on International Security and Cooperation at Stanford University. I asked Rose to help me think through a situation where nuclear warfare might be used in a sort of tit-for-tat. Well, I'll give you an example from South Asia, where India and Pakistan both deploy small nuclear arsenals. India and Pakistan are obviously faced off now with constant conventional crisis. And there have been indications from time to time from the Pakistanis that if the Indians invade their territory conventionally, that they would use a nuclear strike on their own territory in the vicinity of where the Indians are invading to really strike fear into the heart of the Indians and say, we're serious, we're coming after you, you know, back off our territory. Yeah, I just wonder if there's an inherent logical problem there. And I I suppose it helps a bit that you're saying it would be in their own territory. But any time a nuclear weapon is launched, it seems it invites a response. And if it's smaller, (laughs) it perhaps invites a bigger response. Is there such a thing as a warning shot in nuclear warfare? You're pointing directly to the enormous uncertainties and the enormous risks that are unleashed, uh, even in the notion of having a kind of warning shot in territory that's not very populated to send a clear signal to your opponent. It, It is fraught with risk. The idea of the U.S. having a small nuke ready for retaliatory action against Russia, it's hard to imagine that not spiraling out of control. Escalate to de-escalate, it just doesn't seem like a winning strategy. So I asked Rose why she thinks the U.S. is invested in building and deploying new baby nukes. I think that's where you get the arguments that, well, the Russians have more capability because they have more different warhead designs, some of them lower yield, some of them higher yield. We need more equivalence or equality of those capabilities. Meaning we need baby nukes because the Russians have them. And if the Russians use a smaller nuclear weapon... They could gain some tactical advantage by doing so, putting the United States in a position where we did not have either the capability to respond similarly or that our response would be escalatory. But building things because Russia has them, haven't you been here before? Are we back in a nuclear arms race with Russia? Rose says it's not quite that simple because of one thing that we didn't have during the Cold War, something that she had a significant hand in. There's one other reason that I wanted to talk to Rose for this episode. She's kind of a badass in the world of U.S.-Russia arms control. Honestly, as a a once-upon-a-time baby arms controller, Rose was like my Bowie. because of the role that she played in a major agreement that still might be safeguarding us from an arms race today. The Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty that is called New START, I was the chief U.S. negotiator in 2009 and 2010. And the first woman to lead a major nuclear arms negotiation. We've talked about the New START Treaty here on the show before. So you might remember that's the treaty that limits the number of deployed warheads the U.S. and Russia can have. But importantly, doesn't limit baby nukes, just warheads in general. You might also remember it was an early policy win for the Obama administration. Within three months of taking office, Obama had delivered a major speech in Prague. So today, I state clearly and with conviction, America's commitment to seek the peace and security of a world without nuclear weapons, to reduce our warheads and stockpiles, We will negotiate a new strategic arms reduction treaty with the Russians this year. Since together, the U.S. and Russia possess 90% of the world's nuclear weapons. And to lead the negotiations for the U.S., he tapped Rose, the then Assistant Secretary for Arms Control Verification and Compliance at the State Department. Did you catch that title? I told you she was a badass. One of Rose's most vivid memories of negotiating the treaty 
was toward the end of a round of negotiations. We were trying, pressing, pressing, pressing to get finished. And the Russians lost their temper. They said, we're going back to Moscow. We want to take a break. They were on their way to the airport and the Icelandic volcano went off. (gasps) And as they were, you know, it, it had been spewing ash for a couple of days. But as they were on the way to the airport, Geneva Airport announced that they were closing because of the ash cloud from the volcano. Oh, my gosh. They came back. We finished the work we had to do. I just... I had to laugh. (laughs) Mother Nature was on the side of arms control negotiations. Exactly, (laughs) exactly. Mother Nature helped us out. Thanks to Mother Nature and Rose, the treaty was signed by Obama in 2010, pushed through Senate ratification by then-Vice President Joe Biden, and just recently, in January 2021, right before it was set to expire, Biden and Vladimir Putin signed on for a five-year extension, which means we have five years to negotiate a follow-on. And there's a chance, even if it's a small one, that that follow-on could include baby nukes. What does it actually look like to get back to the table and talk about some of these things and begin to put these limits in place? Well, I think we've already seen the Biden administration making a beginning by reaching out very, very quickly to the Kremlin. Rose says that the U.S. has wanted future talks to go beyond current caps to include specific warheads for some time. And it seems like a promising sign that late in 2020, the Trump administration was able to secure an agreement in principle from Putin to a freeze on warhead production. And so we'll see how the Russians react. Their president was willing in principle to do it, but then the devil's in the details, as always. And the details have to do with monitoring and verification in very sensitive storage facilities and very sensitive facilities where warheads are handled. So it's going to be tough. We have the same sensitivities. And she says in the meantime, basically, we have to keep the weapons we have up to date, warheads included. I think of it as a judicious modernization because weapons of this dire type, they need to be safe, secure, and effective. You don't want them to be so simple to use that if a terrorist, heaven forbid, got their hands on it, they could detonate the thing. So we need to ensure that all of these systems are modernized to ensure safety, security, and effectiveness, Mm -hmm. but keeping them under limits. This made me wonder, is there a chance we could just be building and maintaining these things to trade them away in a future negotiation? Some folks have made that argument about our air-delivered baby nukes in the past. It's an, it's an interesting way of doing arms control. But the, the W76-2, that one has always seemed to be something that folks actually really want to incorporate into the U.S. arsenals, and now it has been. Both Matt and Rose told us pretty clearly this one wasn't built to trade away. But does it really make sense to build newish weapons like the W76-2 based on a desire to keep up with the Joneses? Why not? Everyone else is doing it. Rose says that reasoning is flawed. Deeply flawed. You know, nuclear attack is uh, something that everybody seeks to avoid. These arguments come down to whether a country is incorporating nuclear weapons and nuclear warheads into a warfighting strategy or not. And that's what the argument is by some experts who say, that's exactly what the Russians do. We need to have more equivalents. Mm -hmm. We need to be thinking more in terms of of, uh, usability of warheads, nuclear warfighting. And I just don't agree we need to go there. The idea of the U.S. developing weapons that it might really use, say, on the battlefield, that's a pretty scary thought. In other words, it's one thing to want to maintain a robust enough nuclear arsenal that it serves as a deterrent, while at the same time you negotiate treaties with other nuclear-armed nations to de-weaponize. And it's another thing to start stockpiling weapons because you think you might want to launch them. Designing nuclear warheads with usability in mind seems like a pretty radical departure from what the U.S. claims its nuclear posture is, which is basically to deter not only nuclear attacks, but also large-scale conventional biological and chemical attacks, and also reassure allies and partners. But maybe the role of baby nukes isn't so much pushing us toward a new posture as much as it's revealing one that's been here for a while. This escalate to de-escalate doctrine that Russia is supposed to have presupposes that nuclear war can be controlled and that one side can win following a nuclear exchange. And it 
kind of implies that using this weapon might be able to preempt some kind of Russian move or to de-escalate a crisis on, on terms favorable to the United States. But there's not that much evidence to suggest that that kind of thinking is dominant in Russian nuclear culture, but it does exist in some form in U.S. nuclear culture. And in fact, I would say a lot of the U.S. arsenal has historically and currently been postured for nuclear warfighting. The United States nuclear posture currently has a lot of weapons in it, which trend towards using early in a conflict and are designed specifically to be used before they are destroyed. And so now, as a result, we have this new weapon, the low-yield warhead for the nuclear submarines, that I would say probably creates more problems than it, than it solves. Paired with a posture that's organized around actually using these weapons, baby nukes are especially dangerous. Despite their smaller size, and in fact, because they're smaller, some analysts think they lower the threshold for entry into nuclear war enough that it starts to seem like not such a crazy idea. It's just eight kilotons, after all. What's the harm? I don't know. I worry sometimes about the idea of branding it as this low-yield thing. When you say, well, low-yield nuclear weapon, it must calm people. So low-yield is merely the title. Uh, it's like saying that a Hummer is a small truck. If we're talking about a 15 kiloton blast that destroyed Hiroshima, eight kilotons is still, like, very significant. What's important for people to take away from this development is that the United States has a new usable nuclear weapon, what the military itself considers to be more usable. That's the change. So in terms of making a more usable weapon, it constitutes a potentially somewhat tempting option for a president to reach toward in a crisis. Uh -huh. And there were some concerns that President Trump might be tempted to use a low-yield nuclear weapon during, you know, potentially an Iran crisis scenario. And you can mark it down. They restart their nuclear program. They will have bigger problems than they have ever had before. Thank you very much. Everybody. Right. So there were, I believe, is 16 different senators, including Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, and then Senator Kamala Harris, who they all sent a letter to President Trump in 2018 criticizing this plan to build new low-yield nuclear weapons. And they specifically framed it as, this makes nuclear war more likely. They actually are talking about usable nuclear weapons is deeply, deeply wrong. And it is dangerous. So, In the same way that the United States is worried about Russia having lowered the threshold for nuclear use, there's a potential that the response to that, which is building this new capability, has also lowered the threshold for nuclear use. And then beyond that, there's an extra challenge that comes along with the W76 too, which is what happens once it's launched. I guess I would suggest that, you know, once the first nuclear weapon goes flying, even if it is a low-yield nuclear weapon, all bets are off, right? Because how would Russia know that this isn't the precursor to some kind of massive attack? Some experts have argued that early warning systems can't discriminate between a baby nuke and a regular-sized nuke on a submarine-launched missile. And that if Russia sees a missile, it's not going to wait to see which flavor of warhead is inside. If the U.S. were to actually use the W-76-2, Russia would be forced to react as if it had just launched a full-scale nuclear attack. Meaning that these weapons are so risky, it's hard to imagine us choosing to use them at all. Except, why else are they there? Once upon a time, there might have been a sense that earlier generations of low-yield nukes were worth hanging on to and even refurbishing just to trade them away. But now, as we build and deploy even more capable options, it seems like we're actually gearing up for a small-scale nuclear war, or at least flirting with the idea of one, opening up all sorts of possibilities for miscalculation, miscommunication, and just plain accidents. It's a risk that we might want to think a little harder about whether we're comfortable with. After all, the Biden administration doesn't actually have to keep these things around. Things That Go Boom is produced by Inkstick Media and distributed by PRX. 
This episode was produced by Emily Vaughn and me. It was edited by Ruth Morris, John Barst, and Layla Ujali, with special thanks to Matt Corda and Kingston Reef for an extra couple of fact checks. Darian Shulman writes the music for our show, and Robin Wise takes everything over the finish line, in this case with a few additional sound effects from freesound.org. Speaking of finish lines, this is our last episode of the season. We'll be taking a little break, but stay tuned because we might pop in here and there with something a little bit special. And we'll be back this summer with a whole new season. In the meantime, check in with us on social at Inkstick Media and let us know what you want to hear about next. Or just drop by to say hi. A big, huge end of season thank you to the foundations that make our work possible. The Carnegie Corporation of New York and Plowshares Fund, as well as Inkstick supporters, including the Cologne Foundation, Craig Newmark Foundation, Prospect Hill Foundation, and the Jubitz Family Foundation. And as always, to all of you, for supporting our show. Thank you so much, and we'll see you this summer. Baby noobs, utility and arms control. <laughs> Who writes this crap? <laughs> <laughs>